Amen. The title of the sermon tonight is Understanding Your Way, Understanding Your Way. The Bible says there in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24, if you'd read there with me, it says, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? And this is really one of those verses you have to kind of stop and think about it, what it's really saying here. He's saying there, man's, going, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? And what I think the Bible is saying here is that man's, as in mankind, as in the population in general, their goings are of the Lord. We don't know what's going to happen in the world. I mean, we have a understanding that certain things that as we draw closer and closer to the end, that perilous times are going to come, how exactly those things are going to play out, we don't know. We don't know how, we don't know when. But we do know that man's goings, mankind's goings, are of the Lord. The Bible says that the heart of the prince is in the hand of the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord as a, as a river. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And there's nothing that mankind is going to do on this earth that God doesn't let him do. And many and often times, even God even uh, guides and directs him to do. But he says there, man's goings are of the way. How can a man then understand his own way? You know, it's more, under, more important than trying to understand and, and get a pulse on the world and where the world's going and where we're at and, and what's going to happen in the world. It's more important to understand where we're going as individuals, where we are headed. What direction are we as individuals pointed in? What is our own way? Often we get so worked up and concerned about man's way, what they're doing out there, that sometimes we forget it's much more important to actually... Focus on the one person you have control over in your life, which is you. He says, how can a man then understand his own way? And that's an important question. How can you understand your own way tonight? I don't think he's asking that question without answering it in the Scripture. I don't think he's just floating that out there. And I don't think that it's possible to not know your own way. I think it is very possible that a man can understand his own way tonight. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, is understanding your own way. <clears throat> First thing we need to understand when it comes to understanding your way, we need to understand that man's way or God's way, those are the two options that we have in life. We can do things the way we want, the, that the world will tell us to do it, or we want to do it, or the philosophies of the world. We can follow their ways, or we can do things God's way. And hopefully by the end of the sermon, you'll see that doing things God's way is the better choice. That in the long run, though it's not always easy, that it's not always the most convenient way, it is the best way. And that man's ways are inferior and often lead to sorrow and hurt and loss and just many negative consequences. If you would, go over to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. There's two options tonight when we're thinking about understanding our way. There's man's way, there's the way of the world, and there's God's way. And we have to decide every day which way we're going to go. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, as you go to Isaiah ch chapter 55, it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Oh, it seems right. It sounds good. It's got, uh, it, it's got the national bestseller on it. Everyone's doing it. Everyone promotes it. Everyone seems to think it's the way to do things. But the end thereof are the ways of death. They're not God's ways. And they lead only to death. Look there in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. He says there in verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God's saying here, the, the prophet Isaiah is saying, forsake your way. Forsake your thoughts. And try, quit trying to figure things out and how you're going to do things your way. And seek the Lord. Return unto Him. God wants us to do things His, His way because He knows that's the best way for us. He will have mercy on us. He will abundantly pardon. Look there in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. <clears throat> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
And I would even say that they're much higher than even that. And God is just trying to use some illustration in the natural world to help us to understand how much higher and better His ways are than our ways. How much better and higher His ways are than the world's ways. The ways that might seem good, might look good, might sound right, might be popular, might have a multitude doing it, but ends in death. We need to choose God's way because it's the better way. You have two options tonight. You can choose man's way or you can choose God's way. Now, when you make a choice, you often refuse something else, don't you? That's what a choice is. You're presented with two options and you say, well, I'm going to choose this and I'm going to leave off this. I'm going to choose this and refuse this. So when we choose God's way, what we're doing is refusing man's way. We're not infusing it, we're refusing it. We're not trying to blend the two together. We're not trying to add it and see if they can complement one another. They can't. His ways are higher. His ways are better. His ways lead to life. Their ways lead to death. <clears throat> so choosing God's way is to refuse man's way. The Bible says in Amos chapter 3, and we've all heard it, can two walk together except they be agreed? I want to walk with the Lord. I want to walk with the Lord and be close to Him and know Him and His power. But do you agree with Him? Can we, do we agree with the Lord? Do we agree and say, Your ways are better tonight? That I should do things your way? You see, good intentions, they're not an excuse to do things your own way. We say, Well, Lord, I know that your way is the right way, but this just seems like it's uh, the better way for me. You know, I know it's doing things uh, maybe the way you wouldn't want them done, but I'm just going to go ahead and do them because, well, my intentions are good. But that's not an excuse to do your things your own way. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, if you would, go over to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, but it says in, second, in Proverbs 21, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. You see, when we're choosing God's way, we're refusing man's way. And when we choose God's way, what we're doing is acknowledging it as better. I mean, usually that's what people choose when they're presented with a choice. <laughs> I mean, if I were to come to you tonight and say, hey, you can have you know, uh, uh, a head of broccoli or a cheesecake, right? Well, you decide what you choose, I guess. I guess I can't speak for everybody. Maybe there's some real health nuts out there. But we would choose the better way, naturally. We would choose that which is more pleasurable and desirable. We would choose the better way. We don't often always see God's way as the better way. A lot of times we look at God's way and just think, well, that just seems like it's the hard way. What we fail to understand is that the hard way is the better way. And it might have trials, there might be difficulties, there might be persecutions, but in the long run, it's the better way. And why wouldn't we choose the better way? When you choose God's way, you're refusing man way and you're acknowledging God's way as better. But we need to understand something. You say, well, I'm going to choose God's way. I'm going to do things God's way in whatever area of my life. When it comes to choosing a church, what Bible I read, or how I'm going to raise my family, who I'm going to start a family with, what kind of person I'm going to be, all these decisions that we have to make in life. And we decide that we're going to do things God's way. You say, I'm going to do things God's way. You need to understand something. It's the hard way. It's not always the easy way. The better way is not the easy way. And we as human beings have this natural inclination to just choose the easy way we're like you know like water we choose the path of least resistance rather than going up against the obstacle and having to chip away at it and work our way into it and get through it we'd rather just go around it and not deal with it the bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord and he delighteth in his way that's a precious promise in the word of god that the steps of a good man when a good man is going down the right way, when he's walking in God's way and they're ordered, they're ordered by the Lord. And we, we take comfort in that and we're solaced by that and we know that as long as we're right with God and we're serving Him and our intentions are right, 
that no matter which way we're going, God is ordering our steps and we, and we enjoy that. And we, we have peace from that. And he delighteth in his way, the Bible says. God delights it in our way when we walk in his way. But it says in verse 24, though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. It says, though he fall. You know what that tells me? Is that you can be a good man. You can be walking in God's way. You can say, I'm not going to choose the world's way. I'm going to choose man, God's way. I'm going to walk with the Lord. Even if it's hard, it's going to be difficult. You can have that intent. You can say that's what you're going to do. In fact, you can even start out doing it, but you better understand something. You might fall. In fact, on all chances and all likelihood, you are going to fall. That's what makes it the hard way is that you will fall. Because it says there, though he fall. As if the Lord is already anticipating, anticipating the fact that those that, whose steps he orders and those in whose way he delights are going to fall. But he says he shall not be utterly cast down. If you fall, God's not just going to say, you loser. Why'd you even try? Why'd you even start walking down my way? Why'd you even try to go down my path? Don't you know my ways are higher? Who are you to think you can walk my way? That's not the attitude God has. He delights when we do that. And he says, though he fall, though we come up short, though when it gets difficult, we fall, we're not going to stay down. It says the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You want to know what makes life truly hard? We say, oh, the Lord's living for God so hard. You know what's really hard? Not having God and living. I don't know how the world does it. I don't know how people go out there and face this world without the Lord's help day in and day. I don't know how they face the temptations and the addictions and the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations that come in life without God's help. And it's no wonder they turn to the things that they turn to. All the things that they do to try to just forget how hard life is in and of itself. Instead of turning to the one who will not let them be utterly cast down, that will uphold them with his hand. They choose to go through life without the Lord. That's what makes life truly hard, is with not having God's help. And the Bible says in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 15 of Proverbs, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Oh, God's way is hard. I'm not going to tell you tonight that if you choose to live for God, yeah, that it's going to be some kind of cakewalk that says, yea, and all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not going to be easy. <clears throat> it's not going to be popular. Quiet now. But I'll tell you this much. The way of the transgressor is hard. I would say it's much harder in many cases. Because <clears throat> they have no one to help them. No help. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 16, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. It says, A just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. Why? Because the Lord upholds him. God is there to help him pick, himself, pick him up, dust him off, and set him back on the right path, and say, Try again. Do it again. Don't stop. Don't quit. Keep living, keep living for me. He upholds him with his hand. <clears throat> but it says, The wicked shall fall into mischief. And it doesn't say they'll get back up. They fall into mischief and sometimes they never get back up. Sometimes that mischief is the end of their life. Sometimes that mischief just keeps them down. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalms 37, The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. You want to go through life having a sure footing? Do things God's way. You want to go through life knowing that you're not going to have a marriage that's going to fall apart? Do things God's way. You want to go through life being successful on the job? Do things God's way. Understand that your way needs to be God's way. And none of your steps shall slide. You're there in 2 Peter. Look at verse 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, excuse me. Chapter 1, verse 5, and it says, And besides this, giving all diligence... Add to your faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you, that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, 
and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. That's a promise. Look, if you do these things, you add this and you add this, if you go ahead and you take your faith and you add your faith virtue and you add knowledge, you add temperance, you add patience, you add godliness, you add kindness and charity, and if you have these things in you and they abound, you work on them, you make them to abound in your life, he says you'll never fall. But the thing is, we often don't add those things. <laughs> Sometimes we go down that list and we find that some of those things are painfully wanting. We say, oh, I've got the faith, but I haven't got the virtue yet. Well, don't be surprised if you fall. Well, I've got the virtue, but no knowledge. Well, don't be surprised if you stumble. I've got the knowledge, I've got the temperance, I've got the patience and the godliness, but do you have the brotherly kindness? Because if you don't, you might fall. Do you have the patience? Do you have the charity? Because if you don't, you're going to fall. But if you have all these things, you shall never fall. We're going to fall because it's hard. It's not easy to live for the Lord. But it's a lot harder to go out there and live for the devil. The devil is not a rewarder of his servants. The devil doesn't tell his servants, good job. They're not going to get to hell one day with, with the devil and, and he's not going to give them a gold star and say, thank you for being such a horrible person. He's going to enjoy every bit of their misery. You know, we all fall. We're all going to fall. That's just a fact. Here's the thing. Everybody that falls doesn't have the Lord's help. I'd much rather fall and know that God's going to uphold me. I'd rather go through life knowing that none of my steps shall slide. And how do you do that? You get the Word of God in your heart. The law of God is in his heart. You determine, I'm going to live for the Lord. When you're understanding your way tonight, you need to understand, first of all, that choosing God's way is to, choose, is to choose the better way. Look, you have two options. There's, you go man's way or go God's way. I'm going to go my own way. That's man's way. That's the world's philosophy. Choose God's way. It might not be easy, but God will be there to help you when you fall. That's the first thing you need to understand, but also you need to understand it's the direction that we're going that matters. When you're choosing your way, if you would, go over to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. You need to choose that direction. You need to choose to go in the Lord's direction and walk that way. And sometimes people, we, I think every Christian goes through this to some degree or another. They, they start to live for the Lord. You know, they get in a church and start reading their Bible. But you know what happens after a while? The honeymoon's over. The newness wears off. The Christian life becomes work. I'm not saying it doesn't have its excitement. I'm not saying it doesn't have, have its highs and its joys that are always there if we want them. But I'm saying it starts to become work. And they start to look around. They start to think about what they left behind. They start to maybe look what they never had even and say, well, look at the world. Look what the world has. Look what they get to do. Look what they get to wear. Look what they get to drink. Look what they get to look at. Look at all the things, places they get to go. Why do I get to do any of that? What you don't see is where they end up. We never consider where they end up. He says in Psalm 73, of course, this man is lamenting his, his position. He's, he's doing the same thing. He's looking at the ungodly. And he says, as for me, in verse 2, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. His feet were beginning to slide. He was starting to fall. And what was it that caused him to slide. What, why was it that this man's steps were slipping? Well, look at verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish. Who was he envious at? The foolish. I don't know what's more foolish, to the fool or the guy who envies him. The guy who looks at a fool and says, boy, I wish I could have that. Boy, I wish I could have the DWI and the incarceration and the divorce and the wayward children and the diseases and the addictions. Why would you envy that? Because all you see is the pleasure of sin for a season. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Oh, they've got all the fancy things. They've got the jewelry and the 
shoes and the clothes and the cars and, and the ladies and everything else. And I use that term ladies loosely. They got the big boats and the helicopters and the cameras flashing and the red, the red velvet ropes and we envy them. It's possible. You can start to say, what do I got? I've got a little church off the highway with some people in it. No one famous there. There's no, there's no uh, media waiting outside to take your picture and interview you and ask you about how you love coming here or why you're coming here or any of that. And we can start to envy the foolish when we see the prosperity of the wicked. And that's what's going to cause your feet to start to slip. <clears throat> you have to look beyond that. Stay there in Psalm 73, but you have to begin to look beyond that. You need to fix where your eyes are looking when you're walking in God's way. God's way, walking, and walking in the Lord's way, walking in His ways is not just you putting on a blindfold and saying, oh, just lead me, Lord. You have, to, you have to pay attention to where you're going. You have to watch your step. Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We get into this life, this Christian life, we start working for the Lord, but we start to hear those old friends. We start to think about those old ways. What we left behind. What we never had. We envy the foolish. We envy the prosperity of the wicked. And now we're plowing like this. And the Lord's looking, going, what kind of a field is that? What kind of a life is that? Look, at it's all messy. It's inefficient. You're not going to be as fruitful when you've got furrows that are <laughs> going like this. Make the most use of your field. You've got to keep straight lines. You've got to keep your eyes forward. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, Let thine eyes look right on. Let thine eyes look straight ahead before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You got to get your eyes set. He says, let thine eyes look right on. And thine eye looks, look straight before thee. Before you even begin to take that first step. You say, I'm going to choose God's way. I'm going to walk His way. It might be hard. It might be difficult. But I'm just going to keep my eyes looking straight ahead. And then you begin to take that step. And then you begin to ponder the path of your feet. And let thine way, all thy ways be established. God begins to uphold you. God begins to lead you. God begins to direct you. And then once you start to walk, you turn not to the right hand nor to the left. You remove your foot from evil. Don't get distracted. Don't envy the foolish. Don't envy the wicked. <clears throat> if you're going to walk in God's way, if you're going to make your way God's way tonight, you have to understand that you need to keep your eyes fo face, f focused in the right direction. You need to be facing the right direction and not be worried about what everybody else is doing. You need to understand that God's way is better. It might be hard. It might be difficult. It might not be easy. But it's better. You're there in Psalm 73. Look at verse 17. He said, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Whose end? The foolish. The wicked. He was before envious when he saw their prosperity. He was foolish, envious at the foolish. He was envious at the prosperity of the wicked. He was lamenting that fact. He said it was to the point my feet had well nigh slipped. I was going to give up on God and just chase after the world. What changed him? What brought him around? Verse 17. I went into the sanctuary of God. He got in church. He got his Bible. Prayed. He got alone with God. Then understood I their end. And God said, Oh, I know, son. I know, daughter. It looks real good what the world's doing. I know there's a, it's, it's a temptation. I know it seems like they make it look like everything's okay. That They say, come on in. The water's fine. But what you don't see is the shark that's coming. And God shows us their end. He says, let me show you their end. Let me show you where they end up. And you watch some of these people in their life. And how they just, they start out great. Everything's great. All these, how many, how many, I mean, how many music, pop musicians do you have to look at 
Not very many to see this pattern. Oh, they, they're, prosper, they're prospering, they're wicked, but they're prospering. They're foolish, but they're prospering. Everything's going great. And we watch their life over the years. Then they're shaving their head and beating up their car and getting hauled off in straight jackets, drug addicted, doped up, delusional people who have no grasp on reality and end up reprobate in many cases. Dying young, committing suicide, addicted to all kinds of different things. Consider their end before you start to envy the foolish tonight. Then understood I their end. But if all you ever look at, if all you ever see is the glitz and the glamour and, and just look at the way of the world, you're not going to understand their end. You want to understand their end, you have to get in the sanctuary of God. You have to get in church. You have to get in the Bible. He says, Surely thou didst set them in precipitary places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How they brought into desolation, as in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Is that the end you want tonight? Because that's the end that they have. I mean, would you choose that if you knew that was their end? Do you think that's the people that end up like that? They, they start out knowing that? When they chase after the things of the world and they start to serve and live for the devil? They believe in a lie. The devil doesn't tell them, hey, this is going to end in desolation. This is going to end with you being utterly consumed with terrors. Oh, I like the sound of that. I think I'll take that. That's not how it works. He does the same thing to them that he tries to do to us. And just snow us. And just lie to us. And hold up, oh, you know, a, a facade. This is what it is. It looks so nice. It's fake. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You say, I want to walk in God's way tonight. I don't want what the world wants. I don't want my life to end like them. I'm tired of being envious at them. I don't want my way. I don't want to end up in desolation. I'd rather not be utterly consumed with terrors. I don't want my feet to slip. I'm going to get in the sanctuary of God. I want my ways to be God's ways. Then you need to acknowledge your guide. It's akin to, you know, like somebody trying to scale Everest. You know, often people that have never done it, they, they hire somebody to take them up there. You know, they get a Sherpa to try and guarantee success because the way is difficult. They have somebody help them, guide them along the way. And that's what we need to do. We need to understand that we have a helper, the Lord. He's the one that's going to uphold us. When we fall, He's the one that's going to lift us back up. Don't try and scale the Christian life on your own. You won't get very far. You will stumble, you will fall, and you might not get back up. It'd be like a stubborn child falling down and his dad saying, hey, let me help you up. No. I'm just going to sit here in the dust with my bloody knees and elbows and just lick my wounds. And God's just saying, I just want to help you up and dust you off. I just want to clean those scrapes up, put a band-aid in them, help you keep moving forward. I tell you, look out. Don't step there. Put, put your foot here. Acknowledge your guide. I want my ways to be God's way tonight. Then acknowledge your guide. Get in the sanctuary of God. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. And stop leaning under your own understanding. And acknowledge Him. Then he shall direct thy paths. That's the equation there. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And everything that you do, is this pleasing to the Lord? Is this what the Lord would have me to do? Then he begins to direct his, your paths. If you're going to understand your way tonight, which if you're going to understand your way and make your way the Lord's way, then you need to understand to be led, to be led by the Lord is going to require trust. Just like you would trust that guy leading you up Everest. You've never been up there. I don't know how to get up there. A guy like me couldn't even get up there if he wanted to. <laughs> but what if I could? And I went there and I said, hey, are you sure this is the way? I don't know if I trust you. No, I have to trust him. He's going to lead me the right way. And he's not going to lead me astray. I think sometimes that's the problem people have with the Lord. They don't trust him. Oh, they believe in him. They, they, they love him and they say he's good and all that, but they really don't trust him to, that he's going to be there to direct 
their paths. But he will. The Bible says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. You need to trust your guide. If you're going to walk in with the Lord, you need to trust Him. Trust in His Word. And well, I don't know, this all sounds pretty mystical. It sounds like some supernatural business you're talking about. God's going to lie, gonna lead me and guide me. How is He going to do that? God's going to come to you and tell you, whisper in your ear and tell you what to do and tell you what to have for breakfast and what to have for lunch and where to go and make all these, all these decisions? No. He will speak to you, though, but it's going to be through His Word. I always cringe whenever I hear a preacher say that. I don't hear him nowadays, but you listen to some of these old-time guys, and even there are, I'm sure, plenty of preachers out there that still say it. God told me. God told me to do this. God told me to do that. And then they'll say things like, well, you didn't audibly speak, of course. And then if you question it, well, then God must not talk to you, son. Guess I'm not special like you are, sir. Or maybe it's just that you have a misunderstanding of how God really talks to people. You know, God talks to us through His Word, through the Bible. If you're going to trust God and walk in His way, you need to trust the Bible. And let me tell you something. We can trust this book tonight. You can trust this book, the King James Bible. You have the mind of God. Everything that God wants you to know all things pertaining to life and godliness are right here tonight. How's God going to guide you and direct you tonight? Through this book. And through your obedience to it. He says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He went on and said in verse 133, Order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have any dominion over me. You need to trust His Word. That's how God's going to lead you. you. Say, I want to follow God. I'm ready for the hardness. I'm ready for the difficulty. I'm ready. I trust Him. He's going to lead me. I'm going to keep my eyes on Him. Then you're going to keep your eyes in this book right here. And that's how He's going to speak to you and that's how He's going to lead you and guide you. And you're going to follow one step at a time. So often we get so excited about what we're going to do a year from now. What we're going to do six weeks from now or what we're going to do next week for the Lord or what we're going to do way on down the road for the Lord. And the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I remember the first time somebody showed me that verse and said, hey, God doesn't shine the light way down the road. God doesn't take the lamp and say, that's where you're headed. That wouldn't do you any good. He shines it right there and says, that's where you need to step next. And until you step there, you're not going to get there. And you go, oh, I stepped there. He says, good. Now, let me turn the light on again. Step right there. Oh, now, let me read some more. Where, where do I step now? Oh, I step right here. That's how God leads us. One step at a time. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. You don't figure it all out at once. God deals in the short term. Look, our long term is sealed, praise God. We know where we're going to end up. Glory, heaven. That's, that, that's taken care of. Question is, how are you gonna, what are you gonna, where are you going in this life? What path are you going to walk in this life? You don't figure all that out at once. Well, I'm going to live here. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to have this many kids. I'm going to go through this trial, but not this one. You don't get to pick a lot of that. I mean, of course, we get to make decisions, but we don't understand what, God, what all God is going to do in our life. And so often, you know, we, we get, if we get too just, it's got to be this way, then we're not really trusting God, are we? And we might have something in mind. It might be pure. It might be good. It might be right. But maybe God's got something else in mind. And that's where you really have to just start to trust Him. You don't figure it all out at once. The Bible says in James 4, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. He says, For ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. 
but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil, the Bible says. To sit there and say, well, I'm going to go here and go there, and I'm going to be there here, and a year from now I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get this gain here and that gain. You don't know. You don't know what a, what a day is going to bring forth. It'd be better just to look where God's leading you in that next step and just take that next step. And then after that, take the next step. And after that, take the next step and let Him slowly lead you. You see, the Christian life is measured in years. It's true. In decades. But you know how it's lived? One day at a time. The Christian life is measured in years, but it's lived one day at a time. I mean, think about all the things Paul did in his life. The Apostle Paul accomplished the greatest works that we've ever known of. I mean, thousands coming to Christ, hundreds of churches being started, just preaching great sermons, seeing God do wonderful things in his life. Yes, a lot of trials. Yes, a lot of tribulations. And he made some mistakes, and he stumbled, and he fell, and God helped him. We'd say, wow, what a life. But you know what he said? I die daily. I die daily. You know how Paul lived his life? One day at a time. I'm sure he had ideas about what he was going to do, things he would like to do, things he, places he wanted to go, when he wanted to be there. But at the end of the day, he understood he had to live that life one day at a time. That's how you live the Christian life. Jesus said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. <clears throat> I'm going backwards, that's the problem there. <clears throat> if you would go over to Proverbs chapter eleven. Proverbs chapter eleven, we'll we'll close here. We want to understand our way and make our way God's way. We've got to seek the Lord. We've got to seek the kingdom of God. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek that first. Seek doing God's will first. And all these things shall be added unto you. All those things that we get so focused on and worried about and trying to make the emphasis of our life are things that God just wants to add. That will just take care of themselves. If we would just seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness. If we would just live for the Lord today and get through that and wake up and say, well, let's live for the Lord again today and get through that and then wake up and live for the Lord today and get through that, God will add these things. God will lead us. God will guide us. God will direct us slowly. One day at a time. <clears throat> the Bible says the righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. The perfect, those that are made whole, those that are complete, their righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, shall direct their way. Those that are going to seek the kingdom of God, those that are going to seek his righteousness, those that take no thought for the morrow, and understand that the morrow shall take things, thought for the things of itself, that sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. They just wake up in the morning and say, I die today like Paul. Let me live for God today. And I'll let God take care of the big details. I'll let God guide me and direct me and lead me and open up the doors when they need to be open and shut the doors when they need to be closed. And I'll just trust God to lead me day by day. I mean, that's, that's the life I want. That's the life I want. When I get to glory, I want to be able to look back and say, God, just like the song says, He led me all the way. He led me through that, and He led me through that, and He led me through that day, and He led me through that day. Now, how are you going to get there one day at a time? By making your way God's way, even though it's harder, even though it's not popular, but understanding it's the better way. You know, if you want that, and I, I trust everyone does. If we want to live a life led by the Lord, if you want to live a life led by the Lord, you're going to have to live for Him daily. You want a whole life that you can say was led of the Lord, that God had His hand on? 
then you have to live for him daily, every day. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again,